Good afternoon. Our speaker today is Dr. Kerry Lee, who is the chair of the Department of National Security and Strategy at the United States Army War College. She received her PhD in political science from Stanford University and a bachelor's degree from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her work studies how democratic political institutions affect interstate conflict and foreign policy decision making. She has published work on counterinsurgency strategy, humanitarian crisis and intervention, and nuclear arms control and nonproliferation. Dr. Lee has previously held fellowships at the Notre Dame International Security Center and the RAND Corporation. Her award-winning research has been supported by the United States Air Force, the Stanton Foundation, LBJ Foundation, Empirical Studies of Conflict Project in Stanford University, and has been included on syllabi at Yale, MIT, Stanford, and other major universities. Her work has appeared in top journals and publications such as Foreign Affairs, Armed Forces and Society, International Politics, Orbis, and the Washington Post. Dr. Lee is a contributing editor to War on the Rocks, a fellow with the Truman National Security Project, and a member of Foreign Policy for America Next Gen Initiative. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee to our group. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes? Um, good afternoon. Um, I wanna thank Mr. Zhang uh, for, the, for the invitation and the opportunity to present here. I wanna thank all of you for being here and braving the weather and the ice. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who is also listening online and who will, who will look at this recording later. Um, I'm grateful and appreciative for the interest in these topics. Um, an informed community is, is the best community that there is. And so I, I appreciate you all being here and participating. I also wanna thank AHEC for holding uh, this session on Friday afternoon. Um, it gets me out of my weekly staff meeting. And so, uh, so I'm grateful to be here talking about interesting things with, with informed and, and interested people. Uh, so I'm grateful for that. I also need to start this with a, a disclaimer. Um, nothing that I say here today represents, necessarily represents the official policy or view of the Department of the Defense, Department of Army, U.S. Army War College, anyone that I have worked for previously or may work for in the future. Um, <laughs> it is, they are my own opinions and my, my own read on, on what's going on today and what we can expect in the future. This is a really interesting moment, um, and actually somewhat different than what I, I thought I had signed up for when I, when I volunteered to participate in, in this great decisions, because we've been eagerly awaiting official national security guidance from the administration uh, for several months now. And so I thought we might have, uh, when this date rolled around, we might have documents. Um, so as a result, what I'm talking about today is, is largely speculative and based on the interim guidance that the Biden administration issued le uh, last year when they first uh, came into office, as well as um, you know, reading some tea leaves and the, the overall attitude what the, the administration has done so far uh, one year in since taking office. I wanna structure this talk today in uh, to talk about three different things. The first are what I might call um, myths of, or, or kind of bumper sticker myths. So um, what, what should we really kind of be discounting about um, big, about what people are thinking is, uh, is different about today or is a, a slogan of the Biden administration and unique to the Biden administration. The second is I wanna outline some of the continuities that I see between uh, not just Trump and Biden, but kind of long-term U.S. foreign policy. So going back from Bush to Obama to Trump to Biden, this kind of era, this post-9-11 era, and where we've moved in the kind of arc of U.S. foreign policy. And then I do want to talk about what's different. Um, I'm an academic by training, so I'm hoping that uh, this will provide some, a framework for discussion and a, a general way of thinking about things. Um, I'm only planning to speak for about 30 minutes or so. Um, if I run long, then 
that's the academic in me. Um, but I, I really do want to get to a series of kind of Q and A and discussion and and whatnot uh, because I know that this is a this is a topic on which there are a great many things to cover potentially, um, and so I want to leave enough room for for that space. Okay. Um, the first myth or bumper sticker that I want to talk about is this idea that America is back. Um, this is the, the kind of tagline that the Biden administration announced on day one uh, about foreign policy, this idea that America had retreated from the world and is now, uh, it is back on the world stage and ready to lead. The tagline itself, however, um, is not necessarily new. I'm gonna let you read this quote here for, for a quick moment. It sounds like it could have been said by the president yesterday. In reality, this is Ronald Reagan's first inaugural, inaugural address. The second quote, Again, could have been said by the president yesterday. This was Barack Obama's State of the Union address in 2012. The third. Anybody have a guess? Donald Trump. So this idea that America is back um, is, is a bumper sticker. It's a rhetorical idea, right, to, to communicate to the public that we want to take something in a new direction or uh, we want to regain standing in the world. It's more of an expression of where America should be than any rea real reflection of where we have been in the past, right? From president to president to president, there's something that they feel that, that uh, he has felt was missing before and we're going to return to past glory days. Um, no one's ever quite specific about what those glory days look like, right? Um, but it's, a, it's, a, it's meant to garner a sense of pride. It is more emotional than policy. The second, uh, the second major switch that we've seen, at least rhetorically, is this idea from great power competition to strategic competition. I'm a little bit skeptical of whether this is a, a real change in policy. Um, the way that I see this is that it's much more of a rhetorical strategy that intends to de-emphasize um, the kind of US against Russia and China and bring in what we might term middle and smaller powers to, to have a, a greater chess kind of make room for alliances and the international order. By de-emphasizing the, the great power competition aspect, the US is able to continue policy of multilateral engagement, continue policy of uh, using international institutions and particularly US military alliances, but it's seen as perhaps being less ostracizing of other middle and smaller powers. And so when we hear the phrase great power competition to strategic competition, I don't really see much different. Um, it's just a, it's, it's a rhetorical tool. I also now wanna talk about some of the continuities in US foreign policy. Um, there is a real debate in the US foreign policy establishment right now. After the end of World War II, the, the liberal international consensus largely emerged between the two parties. Uh, this was an idea that the United States should play a leading role in international politics, that we had an obligation to be forward deployed to support alliances, that it was in the United States' national security interest to be an, an active ally, an engaged partner, and to spend copious amounts of money, time, uh, blood, and treasure in order to pr 
prove that it was a credible partner in the international system and a leader of that international system. There's a very real debate going on right now in US foreign policy about whether that is true. But neither Biden nor the Trump administration were reflective of that other side. Those inside both of those administrations and, and the president, President Trump himself may have been less wedded to that idea but those who worked in the administration and set policy in the administration most certainly were, for the most part. And so here, I'm, I'm distinguishing a little bit between the president as a person and the president as an administration, which is a, a whole of government approach to international relations. But we are very much still in a foreign policy mode that buys into this idea that alliances are a bedrock of US power, that working across the international system and across international allies and organizations is an important source of both US hard power and soft power, and that the main challenge is those who would rewrite the rules of the international order. Um, this other category of debate um, people inside of, of Washington that are, are provoking this, this deep debate, what we might call folks who are, um, prefer a, a grand strategy of restraint that has yet to really break in in any serious way into an administration. And so what I see is a lot of continuity, at least in the assumptions about sources of US power between administrations. US power comes from having a strong military, it comes from having strong allies, and it comes from being a leader in the international order. This is not significantly different. These assumptions are not significantly different between the previous administration and the current administration. What's also not significantly different is where the administrations fall on a couple of key questions. Um, I'm a very big fan of the book by uh, Dr. Christopher Hemmer, who used to be my boss down at the Air War College, um, called uh, American Pendulum. And in there, he identifies kind of four big questions about American grand strategy that we can predict, we predictably have debates about. Um, the first is the role of kind of multilateralism versus unilateralism. A second is on the role of values. Third looks at um, the degree to which the United States homeland is secure, whether we are secure or not at home. And the fourth uh, looks at whether time is on the side of the United States, whether we need to act now or we can afford to wait. In these four debates, you can really very clearly see how most administrations fall out along these lines. I would argue that on, on three of these questions, we see a lot of continuity between the administrations. Even, I would argue, in the role of multilateralism, again, if you're disaggregating between President Trump, the person, and his preferences, stated preferences, versus the actions of the administration. And so thinking about international institutions as a source of US power, we see a lot of continuity there. Thinking about whether the US is secure or not. Both administrations have been very clear that the US homeland is threatened. Now what those threats are might differ, but they've been very clear about the threat to US security in a new and complex environment that the United States homeland and the American people are under threat. Um, for the Trump administration, this was Chinese aggression, it was hypersonic missiles, it was North Korean missiles, it was very state-based. For the Biden administration, this has a lot more to do with democracy, it has a lot more to do with global pandemics, transnational threats, et cetera, which I will get to in a minute. But both administrations are very clear that the US, that the borders, US borders are not secure. Um, whether we are talking about physical borders or the kind of interconnectedness of society and the global population. This then sparks continuity on the answer to the next question. Is time on the side of the United States? Does the US have the luxury to pursue avenues of approach that take a long time to come to fruition? Or does the United States need to take action immediately 
or reap more short-term benefits because the need is urgent. Both administrations have been very clear that the need is now. Time is not on the side of the United States. In contrast to um, George Kennan's X article talking about the dissolution of the Soviet Union containment as a policy, right? Um, that answer to the question, is time on the side of the United States, Kennan felt was yes. Let's contain the Soviet Union. It will eventually crumble under its own weight. These two administrations would more than likely answer the question to be no. The Chinese threat is immediate. The threat to democracy is immediate. The threat uh, of climate change is immediate. These answers, uh, the, the threats and challenges that we face, both of these administrations see the need for, for immediate action rather than long-term solutions or long-term uh, endeavors that may take a while to, to ultimately reap benefits. The third area in which there's, or the fourth area, I should say, uh, in which there's some continuity between both administrations is in the definitions of certain types of threats. China remains an organizing principle and an organizing um, potential threat for the U.S. government. We are seeing, we saw both administrations leave uh, Afghanistan, pull away from wars in the Middle East, uh, disengage from the CENTCOM area of responsibility, and reorient uh, towards China. This is a follow-on to Barack Obama's initial policy, which intended to leave wars in the Middle East and uh, do the so-called pivot to Asia. So this has been a long-running arc and reorientation along U.S. foreign policy lines trying to get out of the Middle East, reorient towards what was going on in East Asia, making sure that we can contain and challenge uh, the rise of China. Um, as I said before, other types of threats that are not necessarily threats. Afghanistan, very low priority for both administrations. And the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan um, you know, the Biden administration really continuing on that deal that the Trump administration had negotiated with the Taliban and withdrawing suggests that both administrations saw that particular war and that particular engagement in very similar light. Uh, so, what are the implications for U.S. foreign policy? I think this one is pretty clear. Uh, we're going to see a continued emphasis on China from the Biden administration. Um, this is going to likely be reflected in uh, all kinds of different priorities, including funding streams. The Biden administration is slightly different from the Trump administration in that it sees China as a more holistic, less purely military threat. And so you'll probably see the resourcing be allocated slightly differently, but nevertheless oriented towards East Asia, uh, supporting democratic allies in the region and um, and working to kind of contain, contain Chinese influence both in East Asia and globally. Another implication is um, the continued use of instruments of power and policy tools that are more short-term in nature. So things like, can you not hear me? Are we having trouble with, oh. <laughs> um, so. I can project further. I used, I used to be an actress. Um, so instruments of power that yield shorter term benefits uh, rather than investment in long term institutions. What do I mean by this? If we're thinking about the economic instrument of power, for example, there are a lot of different ways to use this instrument. Preferred by um, most administrations in the in recent memory are coercive tools like economic sanctions, financial sanctions, uh, trade embargoes, tariffs, etc. Things that have immediate impact meant to punish or uh, deter action by creating immediate backlash. 
There are other ways to use the economic instrument of power, however. Uh, one is economic aid and foreign, foreign aid, right? Another is investment in uh, local, local democratic groups and money towards uh, civil society groups. Another way that we might use the economic instrument of power has to do with uh, free trade agreements as carrots, right? Come, uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a, is a good example of this that the Obama administration had been working on. What I expect you'll see is investment in instrument, in all of the various instruments of power that privilege short-term gains over long-term investment. And this has to do with how the Biden administration reads the nature of the threat, that it is immediate, it is here, it is now. Time is not on the United States' side. Even with instruments of power that tend to lend themselves towards longer-term uh, investments, like the information instrument, for example, my expectation would be that we, are, we would see much more immediate transparency uh, immediate efforts to publicize wrongdoing, for example, uh, to, to punish with the information instrument rather than the tack that some other, some other administrations have taken uh, in, in history, which is building up rapport, things like Voice for America, things like the US Information Agency, these kind of institutional solutions that provide a long-term information plan. I think we're likely to see the use of the information instrument in a more short, short term, uh, more short term manner. Uh, finally, I think we're unlikely to see serious re-engagement with the Middle East. The administration's, uh, the recent attack on the, the leader of ISIS using a small special forces team, the continued use of drones and missiles, um, kind of policing by air, I think is, is highly likely to continue. You're unlikely to see significant military footprint re-enter the Middle East, even if Afghanistan goes the way that some have predicted um, and, and there's an increased terrorist threat. I think the administration and Biden in particular favors the kind of counterterrorism efforts that lead itself to uh, low levels of engagement but high intensity operations every once in a while. It kind of continued uh, policy of decapitation strategies and, and other efforts that don't require significant amounts of manpower or investment. Okay, uh, what is different? One of the big things that is different that a lot of people have picked up on about the Biden administration is their approach to international politics. Biden's approach to international, President Biden's approach to international politics differs significantly from President Trump's. Uh, Trump's approach was much more transactional in nature, transactional between governments. He preferred bilateral negotiations, preferred bilateral agreements. It was very based on individual bargaining strategies. Biden's approach is interesting because it's relational. It is based on his ability to meet with leaders, to gain their trust, to, uh, and to come to common ground one-on-one. -on -one. It is much more in line with what you would expect from someone who spent decades in the US Senate. Uh, someone who, his approach to foreign policy is that of what we might call, uh, what Sam Huntington called once, a legislative leadership the idea that I am not someone with a particular amount of leverage because I am one of 100 senators, and therefore in, uh, in gaining support for policies, it is much more about the, the kind of continued negotiation, horse trading, uh, coming to common consensus approach that is very much relationally based. I'm gonna to pause to note here also that neither of them, at least in my read, are particularly institutionalists. So President Biden's approach 
to foreign policy is based on one-on-one -on -one interactions and one-on-one -on -one relationships with foreign leaders. That comes with risks when leaders change, particularly when you're taking a spearhead on democracy. Democratic countries replace their leaders. You're constantly rebuilding relationships. Um, and it's not institutionalist in that he's not building new institutions so that if he is replaced or uh, succeeded by a predecessor or when Germany tra um, transfers over from Angela Merkel to, to their next successor, that it's easy for that to, to slot right in. His approach comes with some benefits, however. Um, it makes it easier to do cross-national and multilateral negotiations. Um, his approach, this kind of legislative, relational approach, makes overcoming collective action issues like climate change, things that he prioritizes as threats, easier because you're not trying to exert leverage over 100 other countries. You're trying to work collectively together, even if it means that you don't get as much out of the deal. So the approach comes with drawbacks, it comes with some benefits. Um, it means that the benefits will likely be in the more kind of transnational, multilateral range, less in the bilateral negotiations. Um, the second major point of departure between the Trump administration and the Biden administration is the role of values in US foreign policy. And here, I think, we see two extremes of a debate that has been ongoing in American politics. What was perhaps unique about the Trump administration was that it took a serious step back from identifying US values of democracy, human rights, women's rights, et cetera, as an organizing principle or rationale for conducting foreign policy. This was a significant departure from what had previously been stated US policy. Today, we have a swing in a very different direction. And the Biden administration has not only reinstated, but emphasized the role of values and what we think of as particularly liberal, small l, democratic values as an organizing principle of US foreign policy. This is the central debate. This is the central place for competition in the international arena. Are you democratic? Do you allow your, uh, your citizens to replace their leaders with regularity? Do you allow your citizens to have First Amendment rights? Uh, what we think of, what are our First Amendment rights, speech, religion, et cetera. Do you have a free, fair, and open society? This is now a fundamental part of how the US pursues foreign policy. It has some significant implications for who the US engages as allies, who it engages as partners, uh, and who it does not. It coincides fairly neatly with the switch away from the Middle East, where we had to make some difficult choices about the kinds of countries and the kinds of leaders that we were going to support. Um, and it coincides nicely with the shift to East Asia where we have very strong democratic partners in Korea and Japan uh, and Australia, uh, Taiwan, and others. So it, it coincides, the geopolitical shift from the Middle East to East Asia coincides neatly, conveniently, uh, with this new emphasis on democracy as an organizing principle. It also means, though, that the US is likely to make, to invest resources and to condition support based on democratic reforms for countries that it seeks to engage. I think we are, we are not likely to see the kind of real politique that we saw during the Trump administration, and instead aid, support, and um, an allied behavior will be much more heavily conditioned upon um, 
the domestic politics of the country that we are, we are engaging with. Which leads me to the third point of departure, the nature of the threats. Both administrations agree that the US homeland is threatened. The Biden administration has a much more expansive view of what those threats are. The Trump administration, and particularly under uh, Secretary of Defense James Mattis, uh, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, and then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, had a very narrow idea of what constituted threats to the United States. And they made a, a big effort to prioritize those threats, and that was a centerpiece of their national security strategy, was literally a priority. This was a reaction to what they saw as the national security strategies uh, of the post-Cold War era, uh, the Clinton administration and the Obama administration in particular, but also the, the, first Bush uh, the second Bush administration, that tended to have what they saw as a kind of laundry list of threats. And so if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. And that informed in a, in a significant way the 2018 national security strategy, 2017 national security strategy. The Biden administration has returned to a more expansive definition of threats and de-emphasized the priority list that was put forward by the Trump administration. I think this is a response to, to two things. The first was that when you prioritize and you, when the Trump administration prioritized China, Russia, North Korea, Iran, and violent extremism, the kind of two plus three that we think about in the NSS and the NDS, what that meant is that it pulled resources away from other offices and other initiatives that were meant to essentially hedge against threats. One of those was the National Pandemic Preparedness Office, another among others. The emergence of COVID-19 and the, the kind of global pandemic that we are all still living with today re-emphasized the need to hedge. And I think the Biden administration's tack, tack on this is to return to that in light of kind of being caught unawares or unable to respond to something that, that had been listed previously as a potential issue was de-emphasized and then had global consequences. The second reason I think is much more ideological and it has to do with um, their read on the importance of not just state-based threats but on transnational issues like climate change, migration, and, um, and the pandemic as well as the importance of domestic politics in uh, US foreign policy. And so their definition of foreign policy is probably wider, I think, than we have seen since the Cold War. Um, the appointment of Susan Rice as a domestic policy advisor, despite the foreign policy background, speaks to this that they are actively considering, they actively consider domestic politics and foreign policy as not exclusive, but in fact, deeply in intertwined. And the, the idea that we need to be investing in and considering a whole host of issues from racial justice at home to uh, the Chi you know, Chinese, um, Chinese aggression and the rise of China to negotiations, multilateral negotiations on climate change. This is a much more expansive look at what constitutes national security. And so there we differ. Uh, the implications of this, I think, are pretty clear. Um, the, I expect, uh, that this kind of new definition of security and the, this expansion of what constitutes security interests on which the United States is willing to negotiate, it actually, it, it does interesting things. The first is that when you widen the set 
of potential items and agenda items that you can negotiate with a country with, you can in many cases actually move forward because you're not just negotiating, you're not limiting your negotiations to a single thing. I can give you something on climate change if you give me something on China. Um, and so it opens up opportunities for kind of cross-issue negotiations uh, in a way that if you have a much more narrow definition of your interests and what constitutes your security interest, it's difficult to do. Uh, the second implication is that uh, is potentially more negative. Uh, one of the reasons why the Trump administration prioritized the way that they did was because they wanted to dedicate additional resources to the Department of Defense to pursue modernization, to pursue a lot of priorities that were much more in line with state-centric security threats. When you have an expansive definition of security, it stretches a finite resource pool. pool. And so you risk the going back to the kind of old adage, if everything's a priority, nothing's a priority, and nothing gets funded adequately. And so it, it requires the administration to be creative and judicious about how they dedicate resources in pursuit of their security strategy and how they pursue their agenda.